Welcome to This Is Money podcast. I'm Georgie Frost and joining me and Lee Boyce today is Helen Crane and Ang Harrod Carrick. And coming up, bills, bills, bills. The price gap has fallen, so why will some of us, me included, be paying more for our energy this winter? Meanwhile, water bills are set to soar by almost 50% by 2030. Find out how much extra your provider wants to charge you. Also today, the big whack. I got a parking ticket waiting in the McDonald's drive through I didn't, a reader did, but Crane is on the case. Plus, lots to talk about in the savings market, and SNI pulls its top fix. But you can bag an easy access of 5.2 and the best easy access cash ISA rate in 15 years hits the market. Plus, the current account that pays you. And forget Bournemouth, forget the Costa del Sol. Find out where the perfect place to retire to is. Don't forget you can stay up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by eToro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by eToro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing. But first, inflation may be falling, but the cost of living crisis is far from over. Food prices are coming down from their peak and the energy price cap dropped last weekend. But you're still paying around 10% more for your groceries now than last year. Petrol prices are rising. Mortgage rates are still high. And you may end up paying more for your gas and electricity this winter, too. But how is that possible? And we haven't even got started on water bills. And uh, first, the energy price cap. Remind us what it is, how it works, why it's gone down. Yeah, the energy price cap essentially sets the maximum amount that suppliers can charge for the units of gas and electricity for what they call an average dual fuel household. And basically what it does is it stops energy firms overcharging customers on variable rate tariffs. And most of us are obviously on these variable tariffs because lots of suppliers pulled their fixed deals kind of at the peak of the energy crisis. The key thing to note with the the cap is that the amount that you pay depends on how much you use. It only really limits the maximum they can charge for the units rather than the overall bill so the more units you use the more you pay and vice versa um so as you said the good news is that the cap dipped from just over 2000 to about 1800 this month and it's largely down to a drop in wholesale electricity and gas prices which the suppliers buy and sell on to us so it's good news for consumers in theory but some people's bills are actually set to rise this winter Yeah, explain that to us, because I've done a little video on why you might be paying more. And I got a few Instagram messages saying, have we been sold a pup here? Because I think they're all going to go down. Basically, you're talking rubbish, Georgie. Was I talking rubbish? Explain why some people, including me, because I've gone through my bills, by the way, uh, will be paying overall more. Yeah, there are quite a few reasons, but the main point is that we don't have any government support anymore. So last year we got a £400 discount from October to March, which meant that what we were supposed to pay was obviously kind of kept artificially lower. So this week we ran some figures from U-Switch, which showed that some customers could be paying up to £100 just between now and December. So a low usage household, a one bed flat or you know, a household of one or two people, Last year was set to pay over £400 between October and December, but with that discount, they ended up paying sort of around the 200 mark. This year, they're expected to pay £300 over the same period, which is kind of £80 more over the three months. If we had this support this year, they would only be paying £100. So that's kind of the main reason. Same with kind of other households, medium usage, paying slightly more and higher usage of paying slightly less, but it's still kind of significantly higher than what we were paying sort of pre-pandemic. Yeah, I think I worked out over the winter, I would be paying about £80 more. But just explain, if you would, the standing charge. What is it? Why is it going up? Yeah, the standing charge is kind of the extra bit on your bill. And there are kind of main reason why the bills might be higher this winter. So it's essentially the fixed amount you have to pay every day for your energy. It doesn't matter kind of how much or how little you use, you have to pay it. At the moment, it's about ATP per day for both electricity and gas, which is double what we were paying even two years ago. So that's the thing, isn't it, Lee? So my standing charge is actually staying the same. It's not going up, but it's not coming down. But because I am a one person household, I don't use a lot of energy. So I'm not really noticing 
the energy price cap fall as much as if I was a very large household. So what I am noticing in my bills is obviously I'm not getting the government help and I'm noticing that the standing charge isn't going anywhere. So for me, it's the fixed government help that's really hammering me. So does this explain, do you think, to the Instagram viewers of my video, why some people might be paying more? Can I just say, I wish listeners could have seen your hand movements in that. You were so <laughs> animated by this. The hands were going up, the hands were going down, the hands were going round and round. It was uh, I know. It was it's terrible, isn't it? We I'm should, a mad gesticulator. We should, we should film this podcast, I think, sometimes. And um, listen, the stand in charge is just a, a massive bugbear for people at the moment. And I think this is actually uh, the figures that, that we ran with you switched to and got you switched to, to run. You know, lower household, uh, lower usage households are going to be paying likely more uh, this winter than last winter, despite the price cap fall. Whereas people in bigger homes are likely to see more of the benefit and that is largely a large part of that is the standing charge now the standing charge is used to uh, help keep the network uh, operating you know the infrastructure of it but it's also gone towards uh, all of the supplier failures uh, that have happened uh, in recent years and there's no avoiding it and I think it's just going to become a, a topic that's just going to get hotter and hotter over the next couple of years I mean I worked it out earlier in the year my standing charge for gas and electricity is up 192% uh, in seven years. I mean, that is an incredibly ah. high number. And I think you might have touched on this on the podcast last week, but I was offered a fix by my supplier last week. Now, a lot mm. more suppliers are bringing fixes back out. The jury's out whether it's a good idea to take one or not. Um, Ang actually ran a story yesterday. There's eight fixed tariffs from British Gas currently on offer. I think that it's passing a lot of people by that there is a fixed option. Now, it... It, as I say, the jury is out whether or not it's a good idea to take one. The reason why I ended up fixing, I have, I've taken a fix out until the end of the next year with my supplier, is because uh, the standing charge on the gas element of it was far lower than what I'm being offered at the moment as a variable rate customer. So I decided to take the plunge. We asked Cornwall Insight. Cornwall Insight said that they think the standing charge will continue to rise uh, over the next year. There's no reason for it not to to, you know there's no reason for it to fall basically so i decided yeah. to, to go for it um it's it's an impossible thing to sidestep uh and i think that the the, the price of it is just it's astronomical so whole, wholesale price especially gas have come down so that's good news for consumers i mean bearing in mind the price cap was four thousand two hundred and something mm. last year it was only because of the government uh, capping it at two and a half grand that most of us didn't see bills absolutely rocket i mean we did see bills rocket but not by anywhere near as much as they could have done um and then that's that's up to three grand now but we also that government support that 400 quid that's gone and for many people i just think it's going to be a relatively same winter despite that price cap feeling so much lower uh and, and sounding so much lower than it was uh last year now there's one thing i want to point out about the price cap because Ang mentioned it there, the price cap's just over £1,800. And this threw me this week uh, in a story that Ang did, because the price cap, I thought, was £1,923. Uh, so yeah. That was the ingrained thing. But Ofgem have uh, changed what he considers to be average energy use, saying that basically people were using slightly less energy now because we've become more conscious uh, about how we use our energy because of the rising bills. So it has a new typical domestic consumption value, uh, which has brought the the cap down to one eight three four, and actually I, this is part of my problem with the price cap. I think a lot of people hear the price cap and think, "Well, that's so much I'm going to be paying," but it's not yeah. necessarily true. You know, I'm in a three bed semi here. My forecast for the year is thirteen hundred pounds. Um, you know, it's just because probably I've got better insulation. You know, it's a mid nineties house. Um, you know, we don't we are pretty energy conscious in this house. I and mean, I think there's nothing worse than just sticking on the heat and willy nilly, but that's it. That's a different argument for another time to stick another jumper on, please. You know, it's, it's up to you what you think in terms of these fixes that are coming out, because, you know, not, none of them really are beating the price cap, but in January, where will the price cap be? In my mind, I can't imagine the price cap falling, mm. but that's, that, again, it's a kind of, the jury's out it might fall. But the, the, at the moment, Cornwall Insight have it as going, nudging slightly higher. So I've hedged my bets and just gone for it and fixed until next November. It might be worth just finding out what your energy supplier is offering and what they're doing um, just to see if it's to see if it's a worthwhile thing to do. But I'm telling you, Georgia, I think standard charges are going to become a bigger and bigger topic as the years go by. Our readers absolutely detest them, detest how much they've gone up by. 
It's just so annoying. And I find myself, I don't know if it's because we had that big discussion a few weeks back about dynamic pricing in pubs or something, but I just, everywhere I look now, it's just winding me up. Can we not just get a price for something? Not these sneaky little things where extra bits are added on to just tell me what I'm going to pay. It drives me mad. Um, Ang, though, you've been looking at this. You've been looking at the future of the standing charge of energy bills of fix or not to fix. That is the question. That is going to be the question, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. As as Lee said, it's it's a difficult one because the the deals on offer at the moment aren't great. Um, what you you kind of want to look at the unit price and and what the standing charges actually are in in the fixed deals and where they might you know where it might be next year. I think it really depends on the kind of person you are as well. I'm quite cautious. I like to budget every kind of pound, so I want to sort of vaguely know what I'm going to be paying every month. But as you say, it's really difficult because. You know, it might be a really cold winter or a really mild winter. So it's sort of dependent on on kind of the person. Um, but as I say, that the deals aren't great. I think the best deal in the market is utility warehouse. But, you have, you know, there are kind of lots of different sort of things that you need to get on top of that. And, you know, most of them, you're not making any real savings. So it's sort of a gamble as to whether you think um, prices will rise next year. Uh, let's just take a quick look at, at the help that there is available this winter. British Gas coming out. They've got some half price Sunday deal. There's obviously talk about being paid less to use energy at peak times. We don't have that government support, but is there anything else out there? Let's talk about British Gas, first of all. Yeah, so, I mean, there's always help available from suppliers. You can kind of ask for a payment plan or, you know, they've got hardship funds. The British Gas deal is a really interesting one. They introduced it over the summer and it gives... Uh, customers a 50% discount on electricity on Sundays for five hours uh, and they've extended it through the winter so I think it's a pretty good deal to be honest Um, I mean this year Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve both fall on a Sunday Um, so you can make some savings sort of over the festive period but other than that I haven't seen any sort of similar off-peak deals I think Octopus might have a kind of flexi deal there but British Gas is, is the main one this winter. Lovely. Thank you very much. But we're going to stick with bills because households could soon have to pay up to 44% more for their water, with some paying almost £200 extra a year. The planned increases over the next five years will pay for £96 billion of improvements to the UK's water network, including building 10 new reservoirs and cutting leaking pipes by 25%. But the price hikes will also cover the number one issue that the public has with the water firms. That is the fact the pumping sewage into the waterways. Now, water firms have laid out their five-year investment plans in documents filed yesterday to the regulator off what. Helen, thank you for being so patient. Tell us a little bit more about this. £96 billion of improvement sounds a good thing, doesn't it? But it's going to hit us in our bills. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, in a way, it's similar to the energy companies. Part of the reason that standing charges are so high is because of all the energy companies that went under during the pandemic. Customers are now having to to pay for those changes and pay for the cost of those companies being taken over with water bills as well. Part of what these increased bills are going to pay for is to fix all the dumping of sewage that's happening into our waterways. And I think, you know, this really annoys people when they're seeing these charges going up because of things that aren't their fault and you know with water bills okay some people are on a meter so they can control their usage but many people aren't on a meter and it it doesn't really have any bearing at all on how much you use and it's going up for these reasons aren't you for people you know it annoys people and I can see why it does annoy people so what the water companies have done they've had to uh, lay out their five-year plans to off what the water regulator and that includes telling them how much they think bills might go up um, over the next few years. So this isn't this isn't bills uh, sort of costs that are, are definitely coming to play, but it kind of gives you an idea of how much bills might go up. Um, and it depends on which water company you're with. Again, something people don't have a choice in. So the most unfortunate people could have to pay forty four percent more for their water bill. That could be almost two hundred pounds extra a year for the average household um and that will be coming in uh so in, in the next sort of five to ten years 
so some of the worst, uh, the well, the companies that are putting up their charges the most, Southern Water, they want to hike their current average bill of £439 by £193 by 2030. So that would make someone's water bill £632, um, which is, is a huge hike in a in quite a short amount of time. Um, you know, it depends on the kind of upgrade work that your water firm is doing, but they're they're very uh very largely all of the firms are putting up their bills by, you know, a few hundred pounds a year. So yeah, just another big cost that people are unfortunately gonna gonna have to stomach. Well, potentially, yeah, if it goes through, but you'd imagine it would, because some of these things um, sound pretty important. But uh, golly, I mean, I know this was a while back, but I remember, you know, trying to think what my water bills were. It was always council tax. That's the big one. And ever, and water bill was just that kind of little bit. Maybe it's 150 or 200 quid. And now you're talking 400, 500, 600. It really rocketed up. There's not really a lot you can do about it. But the big question I want to ask you, Lee, is have they just let things stagnate for a really long time and just I mean what have they been investing in during this time if you're you're wanting to build 10 new reservoirs cutting leaking pipes by 25 percent I mean I'd like to see cutting leaking pipes by 100 percent but there you go um what have they been doing apart from pumping sewage into the waterways I think this is uh this is something I think water is one of those things that we all kind of take for granted you know we we have it pumped into our house you know we have clean drinking water and we don't think about it too much because I think it's been a relatively nominal charge for, you know, the service that we get. And as you were saying, you know, a couple hundred quid a year for fresh water being pumped into your house, fresh drinking water, that sounds to me like a fairly good deal. Unfortunately, now we're getting to the point where, you know, there's lots of creaking parts of this infrastructure. And I think it's actually in a way a bit more complicated um, than the electricity industry and the way that you've got to dig up roads and all of that kind of stuff. Um, to to get to the root cause of some of these problems, some of these pipes must be incredibly old. Uh, and then you've got to think about, you know, the population's growing. So, you know, the, that means that we do need more reservoirs. More reservoirs need to be, uh, you know, stuck around the country to to meet increasing demand. Um, I don't know how many reservoirs have been built in this country in the last fifty years, but I don't reckon it'd be an incredibly large number, to be quite frank. Um, the one thing I, I kind of don't understand in a way with the pipes issue is that I thought I, I remember reading a feature a few years ago about the extra technology now that you know, sort of locates these pipes and the fixes that can be done um, using the sort of enhances in technology. But it doesn't feel like anything's really improving. And I think that's where the nub of the issue comes when you start telling people that their bills are going up to, pay, to face this 96 billion pound uh, investment you know i think as soon as you say that to the general public people go where are they going to throw that away you know where's that money going to go that's going to get wasted and it's literally going to go down the drain you know that is what i think that the large swathe of people in this country will think it will just be bloated salaries money just not being properly invested and will the will we see a tangible improvement to the water that you, you get into your home? And the answer is no, because you know it, it's already of the good quality. But they have to keep spending this money to to keep up and you know modernise all of this uh, sort of infrastructure. But when you start going through, our reporter Sam Barker went through uh, company by company uh, the sort of hikes that they're proposing. So as Helen was saying, Southern Water. Uh, by 2030, a 44% increase, 439 to 632. And you've got Thames, uh, they're proposing 38%. Seven Trent, 33%. Uh, United Utilities, smaller at 16%. Southwest Water, 22%. Yorkshire Water, 24%. Northumbrian Water, 18%. Wessex Water, 30.9%. And Anglian Water, 15.5%. In my mind, and the way I look at those figures, I go, cool, oh, Thames, I mean, that is just huge, uh, and seven Trent. You know, I can understand bills going up a few percentage points a year because, you know, we want to mm. make sure that the system's still working and, 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 you know, doing what we need it to do. But I think when you start saying to someone, uh, you know, a, a Thames Water customer, for example, you know, that your bill is going to go up, from 456 quid now to 630 quid when you're saying southern water customer it's going from 439 to 632 they are sizable increases yeah they, they really are sizable increases 
will it get spent properly? That is the question. Um, will we have, uh, you know, real kind of intensity in scrutinising the projects and what's going on? That's why I want to know, because, you know, we're facing bills of soaring left, right and centre. Uh, and water bills are one of those, again, I think it's going to become a hot topic. I mean, it already is a hot topic with the dumping of the sewage. I mean, this is that's a, a, another part of this. Um, people don't want that to happen. People would expect for £96 billion that that won't happen. But you bet your bottom dollar we'll be here. Yeah. <laughs> that will still be happening. And I think that is the problem when you start talking about these big projects of almost a hundred billion pounds are we going to see tangible improvements mm. and if who's monitoring that who's monitoring those tangible improvements what annoys me as well about this is you know if they've been found to do something wrong what happens oh they get fined what are they going to do with those fines Just charge us more to pay for it it's not like it's going to come out of money that goes to to shareholders or anything like that their wages I, it's 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 a bit of a mess. Helen, um, is there anything, though, that we can do to cut down our bills? Is getting a water meter a good idea? Well, it depends on how much water you use, doesn't it? If you're a, a person who loves a bath and, you know, has loads of plants to water in their garden all the time with a hose, then probably getting a water meter isn't going to help you because it's just going to reveal that you use quite a lot of water. Um, but if you are the kind of person who's uh, quite frugal maybe if you're um, I think I'm right in saying water bills are based on things like the size of your property so if you're maybe someone who lives in quite a big property but lives alone so maybe doesn't use as much water as the water company is expecting then getting a meter might work for you it's definitely worth exploring if you think you're not a not a sort of heavy water user I think other than that, it's, it's the same uh, if you, for people who do have a meter. It's the kind of thing that, you know, we've been talking about for a long time. All those tips like get a water kind of controller on your shower, use one of those things on your tap so as much water doesn't come out. But people who are trying to cut their bills, you know, already know about those things, I think. I'm just looking at my water bill at the moment. Um, I think I think it's wrong. Can I just say now is a really good point to uh, double check your bills because when they go out by direct debit it may not actually be right because apparently I've spent 450 pounds on water and I don't ever have a bath I don't have a garden and I'm a single person in a, in a little flat so that that's sounds cool. <laughs> I digress you, I, I, you the, here's you, you a moral the, lesson for everybody check your bills <laughs> you are the queen of the multitask I mean how are you sitting there you've checked your electricity and gas bills and you're checking your water Please. bills I this, mean, this is my like, the admin hour a week. <laughs> Look, this is this is great advice. This is personal finance advice for people. You know, set yourself a little money date. It might be when you're listening or producing a podcast, but it's that good hour one time a week where you can take a look at your finances and realise what on earth am I doing? Anyway, that's it for part one. I'm joined now by Sam North from eToro for our regular weekly look at what's been going on in the markets. Sam, how's the past week been? Yeah, an interesting one. Again, uh, this week was always going to be majorly influenced by what happened earlier today. And that was the latest US jobs report, which came in as a big outlier. The market was primed for about 150, 160,000 new jobs. But the actual number was over 330,000. Markets are not a big fan of this. And they've moved lower since, uh, reaching the lows of the week. Uh, the chance of future rate hikes are therefore creeping back up again. Uh, and when you also factor in the soaring global bond yields, markets are pretty spooked right now. However, there is some good news. Oil came under a bit of pressure this week. Uh, however, it does remain to be seen how markets will digest this latest jobs report. But the higher for longer mood when it comes to interest rates seems to be the play for now. And what's on your uh, radar for next week? Well, next week, we've got quarter three earnings season kicking off just as quarter two finishes. It feels like it's a never ending cycle. Uh, as per usual, it's the US banks that will sort of unofficially kick it off. We've got BlackRock, City, JP Morgan. And Wells Fargo uh, all next Friday. Delta Airlines, Domino's and Pepsi are reporting Thursday and Wednesday. Uh, elsewhere, we've got the latest US inflation number, the minutes from the last FOMC meeting, 
and it's worth looking out for comments from the World Bank and the IMF as they have their annual meetings. Amazon Prime Big Deals Day is happening soon too, so that's always worth keeping an eye on just to see how strong or weak the US consumer is. And for those that care about elections, Poland and New Zealand have those too. That's Sam North from eToro. Cheers, mate. Welcome back. Now, this is a spectacular crane on the case. As if waiting in a drive through line isn't frustrating enough. I only ever done this once. I went to Costa Coffee and it was that moment of like, shall we do it? Other coffee shops are available. Or shall we just park up and go, you know, it was on the way to Derby to watch the football. But once you're there and you're thinking, have I made the right decision? And a car comes in behind you, you're stuffed. And honestly, I don't know what they were doing. I swear we were in the queue for about an hour. It would be better off just to walk, but you can't. You're there, you've committed. Um, But anyway, imagine one reader's reaction. But not only were they in the queue, they got a parking ticket. They didn't even get like a Big Mac and fries or like a Happy Meal. Do they still do Happy Meals? I don't know. Big Tasties are apparently the thing. Um, They just got a cup of coffee. That was it, a cup of coffee for their pains. Helen, take up the story. Yeah, so this is one of my favourite crane on cases in quite a long time. I'm a huge fan of a McDonald's myself. All my friends and family know it's my vice. I absolutely love it. So I was more than happy to try and help out this person. So he got in touch and he told me that he'd received a parking ticket for buying a cup of coffee in his local McDonald's drive through And I was actually, McDonald's coffee is very good. Would recommend people try it. It's uh, very, quite a lot cheaper than some of the other big name brands. And it's quite nice. So happy to back the McDonald's coffee as, as a purchase. Um, but this man, he was, uh, he was going through the drive through picking up a cup of coffee. Uh, it was like, early hours of the morning. So it's this McDonald's, it's on a retail park and it's next to a car park which is operated by a private parking firm called Group Nexus. A lot of people have kind of take issue with these parking firms because I think they can be quite tough uh, with their fines. You know, a lot of people get in touch with me and they say, you know, they have had a fine that they don't think is fair, but they haven't been able to appeal. The appeal's just kind of been been brushed off. So I think people do have uh, gripes with them. But what happened in this case was he got into the drive through and it's, uh, yeah, as I said, early hours in the morning. So he had to wait for 16 minutes for his coffee. He was in a bit of a queue. Uh, so he got photographed driving into this car park area, but obviously went straight off into the drive through, didn't actually stop and park at any point by the parking cameras. And then he got photographed again, leaving 16 minutes later. And then a few days later, he gets through a £100 parking fine for that time. So Apparently there's a what they call a grace period of 15 minutes, but he had overstayed that in the McDonald's queue by one minute. Uh, literally could have been a matter of seconds um, and he got this fine. So he says he received it over a bank holiday. So he kind of panicked. I think he'd never had a parking ticket before. And, you know, you see that come through. You're like, oh, God, look, better just pay it. Oh, actually, it's uh, important to say as well, they normally reduce the fine if you pay quickly. So he ended up paying £60 rather than £100. The kind of thing about it again, he's like, you know, that's actually not fair. I, I didn't park. I would just get my coffee and I've been me up that. Oh, if you pay it quickly, we'll give you a discount. What? Yeah, it's like they, they do rush you into it and I can sort of see why people panic. But he contacted me and he said, look, I think this is quite unfair. Is there anything you can do to help? And I said, I completely agree. He'd actually already spoken to McDonald's. He'd been back into the restaurant and said, you know, is, is this a thing that's sort of happening to people? Because I was just waiting for my coffee and it seems unfair. And they said to him, yeah, we, we've heard of it happening to other people, but, you know, there's nothing we can really do. So he actually took it to the McDonald's head office and they basically said, oh, no, it's, it's up to the parking firm. So not not our problem. Uh, and then when I contacted McDonald's, they kind of said the same. They were like, oh, well, you know, it's, we, we don't own the car park. So sorry. And I thought, well, that's, that's not really fair, is it? You know, it's, if this is affecting their loyal customers, uh, the loyal Big Mac fans. I was like, oh, I don't think that's really good enough. But it seemed like they weren't going to budge. So... I went to the parking firm, uh, Group Nexus, and explained the situation to them. And I was a bit, had a bit of trepidation with this, to be honest, because when I've spoken to these parking firms before, they're a bit spiky in general. They kind of tend to come back and say, well, you know, they break the rules. That's that. We've, we've looked at it. And this, you know, that's our decision. So I kind of didn't really have very high hopes of them sort of taking pity on, on this guy or, or actually not even taking pity, just doing the right thing. And actually, I was wrong to think that because when I explained it to them, they came back and they basically said, yeah, fair enough. We'll we'll pay the money back, Um, which is great. They said they've also uh, revisited this kind of 15 minute rule because 
they've noticed that people are queuing for like a lot quite yeah. a long McDonald's drive through late at night and they've changed the uh, rules for the car park so it's it's a win for the Big Mac fans everywhere I think it, it is um uh, I think I don't, I don't know I haven't had a Big Mac since I was about 11 or any McDonald's for that matter um but well done Helen now Lee you are something of a can I say sort of parking vigilante I mean you you this this really gets on your nerves it massively gets on my nerves it's just a very mm. back onto this case right I mean first of all I don't really understand some of these fast food chains in general it's not really fast food is it I mean how is it that you will get served that slowly and, oh yeah and, you, know, um, you know that that's that in that sense it's quite bad in 15 minutes I mean that is it's like dicing with time isn't it you're kind of going to be panicking the whole time um, or you know and you can't get out of the queue you can't reverse back out as you say you're stuck so yeah. what you might say so admittedly I'm, I'm glad that the private parking company um uh, you know has seen sense in this and I should point out here that these are, are, are private parking charges they're not actually fines only councils can give you a fine it's like legalese just in case anyone's listening to this so if it's not a fine it's a parking charge um the other thing about this case I thought that was quite unusual is the fact that McDonald's didn't help the customer whatsoever I was quite surprised about that because I have read cases in the past uh, from supermarkets and uh, other companies where things like this have happened and they usually step in and you know any sane person would go yeah that's a bit out of mm. order, isn't it? like I get it they've got that 15 minute grace period at night time to stop antisocial behavior and people going in that car park and doing donuts and whatever weird stuff and I, I mean in the car sense not donuts from McDonald's um you know and 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 taking the mickey out of the car park and, and doing stuff but you know you have to say that that is that is pretty dark that pretty dark but yeah you know, I don't know if I call myself a vigilante. I think I'm just a, <laughs> a purveyor of of common sense. Um, right, Lee. Sorry, you know, and, but and, vigilante and, and sounds fun. I've got previous, and the people who listen to the podcast know I've got previous in this. I've, mm. I've had three private parking charges. I say me, even my wife and me have had three private park, and each one has been completely unjust, including once when I was in a car park and paid and even put in my registration plate, which was entirely correct, and I had to the statement on my bank account and somehow they were telling me that I, we hadn't paid no <sighs> idea another time when my uh then pregnant wife stopped at a bp garage for a few minutes to be sick because she <laughs> had um you know she had morning sickness mm. uh and you know basically because she didn't buy fuel um we got done for that and i can't even remember what the other one was about now but all of them i took through poplar now poplar is the parking on private land appeals uh and basically you shouldn't be panicked into buying one of um, buying one of these paying one of these charges mm. as this person was in this instance it was a bank holiday they felt under pressure to do it because it's that silly threat of you, you know, if you don't pay, you know, you're not going to get this half price discount, which I think in itself is an absolute disgrace and something mm-hmm. that should be sorted out. Now, we've been we've been long on the case of the private parking uh, companies, Georgie. I'm not saying that we we should be it should be a free for all. Look, there should be rules in place in car parks and private land. I get it. But the rules should be fair and they shouldn't be to the detriment of the motorists where. You know, we're already, it's already a bit of a pain in the butt driving this country anyway, isn't it? It's not exactly the great experience. And when it comes to parking, it's just like another thing you've got to like sort of worry about. And sometimes you're driving into a car parking, it's really hard to sort of clock the signs and it's all quite complicated. So let's rewind the clock, go back to 2018. We started a campaign about this. This is money. We had a big campaign about it. We were getting a flood of people getting these private parking charges. Uh, and we had some recent data out the last couple of weeks. It's at a record high uh, since then. Now, we kind of ran a number of stories. Um, we made really good ground on it. Uh, there was a, a new po- parking code of practice um, that was meant to be coming in. Um, and we thought, here we go. This is great. So let me take you back, if I may, to March 2019. And we got a certain MP uh, to write us an open ed uh, on this is money. Now, when I say an open ed, it was at the bottom of one of our stories. We didn't even let him have a, a full story. It was just like a, yeah. a fat box in one of our stories. And I'll read out just a sentence in here. I'm happy to say from today, things are changing. The government is putting an end to the bad behaviour of road parking operators for good as the parking code of practice that becomes law. Now, the MP in question that wrote this for us, it was mm. a Rishi Sunak, 
Uh, oh, yeah. Malchus happens to be prime. Where's he now? Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was just a, a local... Well, well in a few years, isn't he? Local government, government minister uh, at the time. But I feel like nothing's happened. So this the, the kind of a bill has been sort of drawn up and it got delayed in the pandemic and then there was now there's another consultation and the consultation is closing soon but we're years down the line how how on earth has it taken so long this is such a clear simple win people just don't want to be ripped off by private parking companies that is the long and short of it a lot of these charges are out of kilter of what they should be that whole element about you're going to get a discount if you pay it fast which instills panic you know something you've got to go oh if i don't do it soon i'm going to get that i'm going to be charged even more which is just an absolute outrage and things just simply have to change so we are back on this off the back of this uh mcdonald's case we're back on this we're finding out what's going on we're going to start holding some some government people to account I and mean, i won't rest now i won't rest georgie do it Lee. it's sorted out because we're fed up of it I mean, yeah. most of us most of us have had one of these parking charges mm-hmm. uh, over the years you know even completely not your fault and it's not fair and we've got to make a stand it's it is it's so annoying this i'm still waiting for a parking charge for stopping off at a car park that had a public toilet next to it it's like because i only needed the toilet i mean you just know that that's going to be the case i I think it i think it kind of makes sometimes it can make driving a little bit unsafe as well because you're kind of so foster of trying to figure out whether or not you can stop there park there then you kind of you know you've got that in your mind and then you're trying to drive and you're trying to do this that and the other i think we just want i think you know i'm not speaking for everyone here but i think the majority of people just want to be treated fairly uh and just think you know there, there is a way to dispute these charges through that popular system which at least is something um but mm. things things have got to change i mean I, I haven't got the figure in front of me but um the number of parking let me, let me get it up actually the number of parking charges uh, in the last year is at a record and here we go so private firms issuing 30,400 parking charges per day wow per day there was a record 11.1 million charges from private firms issued in the year to march 11.1 million and that is a 29 percent annual increase wow. That's this is why it's back on my radar again because I couldn't believe that when I saw that figure, and I, I was going to say a, a figure like that before I checked the story out. Uh, it's actually worse than worse than what I thought it was. So eleven yeah, million, it, so eleven million times yeah. people are breaking regulations. We are a bad country, or that is a bad system. Well, it's not the regulations; it's what the uh, private uh, yeah. land operator. Ha- usually, you have. I a think most people in this country and... would like to adhere to regulations, whether they're it's a private or whether it's council. So it's either suggesting that we are all bad, bad, bad people, ignoring signs, or there's something really, really wrong with the system. If you've got 11 million, I know which one I believe, Georgie. I know Do which one of those two statements. Yeah, yeah. I saw Ang. I saw you were nodding along there. Do you think we're a bad, bad, bad country full of bad people breaking rules? I think, you know, the the thing that is so baffling to me is that there's been this, ma- you know, in the last couple of weeks, this massive kind of fight back on the war on motorists. And yeah. the one thing that Rishi Sunak has been kind of beating the drum on. And this is such an easy way. It's far easier than spending billions on filling in potholes or, you know, scrapping HS2 and putting more money into to railways and um, into most ways rather um private parking is such an easy win and you know we know as lee said that he supports it so yeah he he should he should be doing more on that i think indeed helen i'm sure you'll get loads of uh, inquiries about this and other sorts of things how can people get in contact with you to get a crane on the case yeah, please, please do drop me a line about this or, or any company you feel has, uh, has done you wrong. Um, so drop me an email. It's helen.crane at thisismoney.co.uk. Um, let me know what the company is, when it happened, uh, any sort of account details or customer numbers that you have is always helpful. And remember to say that you give me permission to talk to this company on your behalf. Also, a quickie, Helen. You do also like to praise the good companies. Have you ever seen? Have you seen any this week that um, particularly worthy of praise? Um, 
not this week. I will say, like, people praising Last month. Has been, uh, <laughs> slightly, kind of, slightly thin on the ground, to be honest, lately. Um, I will say, you know, I would actually like to praise Group Next as the company in this case, which is so rare for a, a parking firm, for actually taking a, a kind of a common common Lovely. sense approach. But yeah, my, my inbox has been uh, remarkably bare of people praising companies, possibly because it seems like all companies are just putting people's bills up at the minute. But if you have a company that you mm. want to shower some praise on, please drop me a line. My goodie and baddie this week, same thing, is uh, Travel Lodge. I don't mind a Travel Lodge, like it, good value. You get what you pay for, to be fair. But uh, I didn't expect to pay for wet carpet and smelly dog smell. It's a smell that, you know how you're around smells? And after a while it goes, ah, no. I kept waking up and it was like, it was still really smelly. So the receptionist, he came with his Febreze. That was his answer because there was no other rooms to move me to. Didn't work. However, I did just write to... um, travel lodge and said look this was the incident send them a picture of my tweet that was my evidence and they just gave me a refund i didn't even have to do anything i didn't have to speak to anyone it was within days not that i mind speaking to people that's okay but it was just yep and they said is this the only issue i was like yes it was a pretty significant issue and then boom i mean i didn't get all of my money back but then to be fair i did get a quite comfy bed so it was fine and i don't mind travel lodge so there you go winner and a loser in that case i digress though uh, lee just a quick one big news in the world of savings well not big news but lots of news going on at the minute uh ns and i just pulled its table topping 6.2 percent fixed growth bond so if you missed that you missed out but some highs for easy access accounts and an easy access cash isa that's almost record breaking kind of lee and take a breath. I'm going to go. I'm going to give you a whistle stop savings and banking tour right now, really, really quickly. So, uh, the popular NSNI 6.2% uh, one year fix has gone. Uh, 225,000 people opened the account, which is just an absolute bonkers number, but shows you when NSNI goes market leading, it becomes incredibly popular. The best rate you can now get is 6.11% from a number of, bank, number of banks, including Oxbury and Smart Save. Uh, we've got a, another new easy access Best Buy. So uh, you could already get 5.2% with Commentary Building Society, which is a uh, limited access one. One, you can take out your money three times uh, over the course of the year without penalty. But NatWest has launched a, a sneaky 5.2% uh, rate that you might not know exists because it's through its Ulster Bank arm. Um, now, you can still open that account um, even if you're not in Northern Ireland, but only online. So you just need to be a UK resident and you can get that 5, 5.2% rate from NatWest. Uh, we've got a new Best Buy cash ISA. Cash ISA is, again, having a moment in the sun, uh, as, as, as same as short-term fixes, really. Um, you can now get 5%. First time you get 5% for a uh, good 15 years, uh, and that's with Moneybox, uh, which is an app-only provider. So it won't be for everyone, but that 5% rate is, is, is table-topping. It's very good. Uh, outside of the world of savings, uh, we have had uh, a move from Starling Bank, which I actually think now make Starling back an incredibly attractive proposition as a current account if it wasn't already. Um, mm. I'm speaking to someone here who has a Starling bank account as a secondary account, not as my main account, but this has got me semi-tempted to go full scale on Starling back. And I reckon a lot of people are thinking the same. And that is the fact that they are now offering 3.25% interest on balances up to £5,000. So essentially, you know, there's a lot of banks out there now that will charge you for your current account. And this one's paying you. Uh, if you if you keep five grand in there, that's not a bad sum of money you're going to get paid out each month. I think uh, Helen Corain, our savings uh, expert, crunched it at thirteen pounds fifty four a month, which over the course of the year, that's not a bad little bump. And actually, you could say, well, wouldn't you just put it in a savings account? But a lot of people do like to have a nice the big bank yeah, Is that nice such buffer. a good? I have to ask though. Do you think it's a good? thing it's it's a i mean it seems attempting you know great that's really nice but you're encouraging people to do something which probably might not be a good idea if you're loads of people save their money or keep their money in current accounts and they don't put it into savings accounts don't invest it yeah i think people just like to have if if you you know depending on your lifestyle i think that having that kind of biggish bank balance you know five grand is quite nice as if you mm. if you were in that position I think it's just quite nice to have it there. I think a lot of people, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but I mean, as we look at data, a lot of people do just park money in their current accounts because 
it's there in a you know uh, far you get it out of the cash yeah. machine you know you go into a bright you can't go into bright styling but you know you just know it's there whereas you know it's there in a savings account but it's like another step of having to like take it from one place uh to another and i feel like i should uh probably uh also just in the savings and banking part just have a real real uh touch on metro bank which has had a bit of a, a hairy week uh this week we've seen a share price uh on thursday dropped by uh, around a third i mean the share price on metro bank has not been great since the ipo um and I, I won't go into too much more detail on that but basically uh, it's looking like it's going to need to borrow some money um and there's been various meetings with uh, bank of england uh yeah, officials which it said was scheduled to happen anyway and the one thing i would say and this isn't to panic people about macho bank whatsoever mm. this is just uh, the savings and banking world in general if you're uh with the financial services compensation scheme uh registered bank which most banks and uh, building societies are they, they will show you that they're fscs authorized uh, on its website, uh, various parts around branch and stuff, you're protected up to the tune of £85,000 per institution. So it's always worth refreshing your memory on the FSCS rules. Um, and that, and that, it has been another mad wo- another mad week, Georgie, for, for savings and banking, really. There's lots going on, lots of moving parts. Um, there's still good savings rates out there, but I would say that with that 6.2% mm. NSNI pool, I think now quite possibly we've seen the peak uh one year fix i think so i mean that, that i mean to have two hundred twenty five thousand people open that account um you know if you really wanted a top one year fix you would have gone for it and i just can't see rates above six percent in one year sticking around for too much longer you've called it lee all right, we'll keep you up to date on all of those stories. But finally, uh, Helen, where do you fancy retiring to, if you could have a choice? Oh, it's a, it's a tricky one, is it? I mean, are we talking just the UK or can we be... Oh, no, Helen, you world? can go anywhere. Oh, I reckon I would probably go somewhere, maybe do the classic, like, south of Spain, somewhere, yeah. you know, yeah. on the beach, bit of a cheaper cost of living. Nothing nice. else is there. Very nice. nice. Beers, cheap beers, tapas. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Ang? Um, quite like the idea of France, although their bud bed bug situation is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, quite like the Silly Isles as well, but they seem sweet. Okay. And Lee? Sorry, I just accidentally muted you. muted me, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Georgie. <laughs> I don't want to answer this one. Lee, Essex for you? Oh, no, I'm thinking bigger than France. I'm thinking bigger than Spain. I'm thinking a, a nice, sizable yacht just parked off of Antigua, I think, is what I'm going for. Champagne, constantly on ice, uh, constant supply of McDonald's coffee. No. Did you read the story, though, of the couple that basically bought back-to-back trips because they worked out that it was cheaper than going into a retirement home? Back-to-back cruises. That sounds like quite a nice idea, but I don't really like cruises, to be fair, too much. No, I think I'd rather dancing. be in a retirement home. If I'm being honest, uh, no, I'm sure it'd be a, a nice, nice experience. It, that that story, I'm sure, is it's an ugly head every year. Probably There's someone Probably. That is, that's beating the system by going around on a constant world around the world cruise. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Where, where's your perfect retirement spot, Georgie? Lee, I'll just be grateful to get to that age. Right. Uh, why are we talking about it? <laughs> why are we talking about it? Because the list of the UK's top perfect retirement locations has been revealed. And there are some surprising names on it. I'd probably go for the south of Spain like Helen. Consumer Group, which has taken retirees' wish lists for their later life locations to work out its own grouping of the top 12 places to spend your golden years. So reveal all, please. Helen, as I started with you. Yes, unlike us, they're not just looking at nicest beach and warehouse cheap <laughs> wine. Uh, they've actually looked at some slightly more sensible things. There's something like, else in there than that? Yeah, I know. It's yeah. wild, isn't it? Um, so they've looked at things like uh, availability of healthcare and access to green space, local leisure activities, low crime, affordable houses, and how happy people are. I mean, it is actually quite sensible. Mm. Uh, so... The top places to retire in the UK, if you'd like a rundown. Mm. Number one is Broxbourne. Number two, Elmbridge. Where? Where? Bourne. Broxbourne. Is it, you know what? It's where? You're going to ask me that, and I don't actually know where. <laughs> it's, it's Does anybody Sussex. know? Parts <laughs> Essex border. 
He's where? Uh, Hearts Essex border. All right, then, Lee. Uh, okay. Broxbourne, right? Yeah. Uh, number two is Elmbridge, which I think is Surrey. Uh, three, Exeter. Nice place. Yeah. Four, uh, High Peak in the Peak District. Yeah. Five is Kirklees, which I think is in Yorkshire. Yeah. Uh, six, Merton, South London. Uh, oh. Seven, uh, County Antrim in okay. uh, in Ireland, Northern Ireland. Uh, eight, Newcastle under Lyme near Stoke on Trent. Oh, yeah. uh, nine, the Outer Hebrides, right. in the very far northwest of Scotland. If you don't like your family and want yeah. to, yeah, I mean, plenty of people, you know, happiness. Have, you've lived for lived for a long time. You've dealt with a lot of people. Maybe you're fed up of people. And yeah, you know, fair, fair, fair play to them. Uh, and rounding off the list, South Tyneside, Stockport, and Wrexham. I'm, I'm somewhat baffled by that list. I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, I didn't. I deliberately didn't read this because I was like, I want to be surprised by the amazing place. And don't doubt that those places that I've never heard of in the UK are amazing. Lee. This is a uh, survey that's been done by which and it asked uh, people what they thought was most important to them when it comes mm. to retirement. So unsurprisingly, healthcare was number one. Access to green space was number two. Then local leisure activities, uh, low crime, affordable houses and how happy local residents are. Now, I would have thought that the affordable houses element comes into play for a fair amount of those uh, places, and especially because it becomes hard to downsize. Uh, depending on your circumstances mm. and actually you know healthcare it, it's a massive thing if you're in a uh, really overpopulated town you know I think a lot of us listening to this podcast and probably have a story about how hard it is trying to get into the local GP for example so all of those kind of things are factors but I must admit I did raise some eyebrows at the Outer Hebrides I mean that is the kind of uh, sort of retirement spot that on paper actually sounds quite nice you know you've done the rat race and then you're thinking oh like nice long walks you know nice and rural uh you know it's meant to have a number of gps there so you, you're covered on that front um i think that some of the things that you're not factoring here and actually one of the top things that i would have said uh in this survey that if it was asked to me uh would be weather I'm not convinced. Yeah. I reckon it's quite a wet, windy type of place to live. Uh, I also think of retirement. Uh, I mean, I don't think of retirement because, you know, we're all a long way off. But I think retirement is a bit of a two, it's a two phase process. I think you have the first part of your retirement when you're hopefully still in pretty good health. Um, you still can do those kind of long walks, you know, and those kind of leisure activities that you want to do. And then, you know, phase two is kind of when you're relying probably a little bit more on the healthcare system, um, things get a little bit more tricky, you know, in terms of like mobility, you know, do you want to drive anymore? You know, can you drive, you know, can you really walk feasibly and enjoy the Outer Hebrides out? or kind of lifestyle mm. i don't know there's lots of factors at play that i'm not convinced have really been thought about in this survey and, and the other thing actually the other one uh, other mm. than weather i would say is closeness to family members well Lee, I've, you know. I've got to jump in here because i'm a bit of a geek but no you don't have to leave lee you can stay in this conversation but i do want to jump in here because there was some research in february from harvard that said the one thing above everything else so it's not career achievement it's not how much money you earn it's not how much exercise you do it's not how many green juices you drink in the morning the one thing over this 85 year study that they did that shows how happy we are are our positive relationships with people our networks so the idea of sodding off to the outer hebrides i don't know not to poo poo this research and i get the point but before you do up sticks and leave all your family and friends, bear that one in mind. I guess I guess the argument, though, in a way, is that's all well and good. But there are a lot of older people out there that potentially don't have those relationships anyway. So they don't have, They'll have their mates, even well, if their yeah. family aren't around anymore. Not necessarily, Georgie, not necessarily. Really? University of the Third depends. Age and all that sort of thing, you know? It depends. And, you know, you might go, I, I don't know what it's like to retire into the Outer Hebrides and there might be good retirement oh, clubs out there. If you have you know. retired to the Outer Hebrides, do let us know. Yeah, well, definitely do. Or if you have retired to somewhere that's perhaps not your typical place to retire or you've done something a little bit unusual or you know someone that's done a little bit something a little bit unusual love to love to hear about it 
I mean, I said you're Antigua. I'd say I'd buy a camper van and tour America or something like that. I mean, honestly, I I, I like to think I'm going to have a bit of a rock and roll retirement, Georgie. That's that's the plan. Uh, but obviously, you've got to have some diligent savings plans in place to do that. But we that's a podcast for another time. That's what you're there for, Lee. That's uh, this is money's purpose, so you can get your van or do whatever you want in your retirement. Go to the Outer Hebrides. You can keep up to date with all the latest breaking my news because that is it for this week. Uh, just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. If you have any comments or questions for the team, you'd like to tell them where you've retired to or where you want to retire to or anything else you'd like them to look into. Have you been parking fined or charged for stopping off at a toilet or a McDonald's or a Burger King or any other eatery? Lee? And also, if you like one pound McDonald's coffees, honestly, I'd like to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, editor at thisismoney.co.uk. You can also uh, leave comments in the uh, article in which this will live. And you can also X us at This Is Money. And Helen, Lee, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. And if you like our podcast, why not rate us wherever you found us? It helps other people find us too. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by eToro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by eToro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing.